Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It's been an exciting week. In fact, Pedro and his crew are outside working on the flagstones around the pond as we speak, and we are bringing you along for that. Um, so you're not gonna see it like in one, one video all by itself. I'm just going to capture it as I do it. Like yesterday, I captured day one. <laughs> and today is day two, but it's so exciting to see that area come together even more. I think we'll use it even more once the patio's in place. And especially like the kids dangling their feet over the yeah. edge. Because uh, with those, uh, what are they called? Cinder like blocks? blocks, yeah. yeah. It's like not as comfortable as like a like a paver. Well, and the blocks blackstone. like butt right up to the mulch. And so yeah. there's always mulch, especially after the rain, like on yeah. top of the blocks. And so now it's going to be just a clean surface. And we do use it a lot, like every day out there sitting. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just so exciting. So... Let's just jump into the videos from this last week. First one was working on the fruit trees in preparation for a storm, plus planting a dwarf birch tree. So we were expecting the tail end of Hurricane Hillary, which I think we might have talked about a little bit in last week's video. Um, but this happened to be the video where I uh, was prepping for it because I looked at our fruit trees and thought, there's no way. There's no way this nectarine tree is gonna survive any load of water or wind because it was so heavy laden with fruit. And the amazing thing about that is that I had already thinned. I had already thinned those trees. So next year I'm just gonna be way more. You can see why uh, professional growers, like why they grow the trees in that kind of vase shape. Yeah, that, that and they keep do. them at easy, easy reach. Yeah. Um, and I'm just gonna be way more aggressive with thinning next year when they're this big. It doesn't seem like they're ever going to get, you know, right. huge. Um, so I thought I had thin I thinned out about 50% of what was there. Can you imagine? That tree would already be broken yeah. had I left everything on there. But uh, And then we planted the cinnamon curls birch tree. Replaced a ginkgo, skinny fit ginkgo that just up and died. It was fine earlier this season. That? Yeah. We were watching the water. I know Paul and Bethany were watching. They were like finger testing soil and looking around. I couldn't find any insect, nothing. We have pretty good, we have a pretty good ratio of things that live to don't live. Yeah. Cause we plant a lot of stuff. Right. So all in all, maybe it's just kind of like some things just aren't gonna live. Yeah. And there's not a lot you can do about it. Right, and that was one of the ones where I was like, eh, I could put something that it's I like better because there. you didn't expose the uh, root flare. Oh, for crazy. That's probably why. Or let's, let's, or, let's bring up that topic not, <laughs> early today. You didn't today. do a square hole, that's why. Yeah, anyway, first comment was from Petty Westridge. I understand the thinning part, but why can't you eat them or make jam or something instead of giving them to the pigs? Because they are rock hard, rock hard fruit. I mean, they had started to put on some color, but there's no, I mean, there's probably a way one could use the peaches or nectarines, whatever. But the hogs but, have to eat too. Yeah, exactly. So like, why not give them a food source that's right. like, why go out of your way? Right. Uh, Bethany sent me some footage, um, but like we had to figure out, I don't know. It was grainy. It was like uh, low quality. So I need to figure I, out how to get that footage from her. I asked it was her, I'm like, cool. hey, when you give them to the pigs, could you take some video so that yeah. I have proof that they actually do go to your pigs? Um, so well, I can play the grainy footage. I mean, you can see, you can see what it, it looked like. Yeah. But it'd be nice if I could get the full resolution. You know, it's so nice because like when we get ready to clean out tomatoes or whatever the case may be, uh, Paul just pulls his truck up beside whatever crop we're getting rid of, the vine crops too. Mm -hmm. And he just loads the back of his uh, truck up with all of that stuff and then they just take it out and feed the pigs like all of our stuff all of that kind of stuff yeah. that we get rid of um, and that's such a a great use for it yeah so and it's free feed for them too right uh tim or time time a holly said do you spray the peach trees also or only the apple i spray all of them in the winter so i do the liquid cop um and horticultural oil in the winter time and we've done videos I think I do a video about every time I do it mm -hmm. usually you want to do um, it three times in the winter I, I want to say that it's like early, early fall like November ish and then another one on a really nice day in January and then another one usually about Super Bowl Sunday <laughs> usually falls right around mm -hmm. in there the orchard people around here the growers the growers of orchards say as long as you hit that third one, like that's the most important one to mm. hit. It's typically what I hit, but. But you should be doing November, December, three. and January. No, like end of November, beginning of December, January, and then February. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, and okay. sometimes it's like the first of March-ish when you get around to it. Sure. It depends on your weather that year too, uh, because you do have to wait for nice days. The difference in why the apple got worms is that you do the winter stuff, and that kills overwintering insects and helps prevent disease and fungal issues. 
on apple trees specifically, you're supposed to do a more of a contact spray once two thirds of those blossoms, when your tree's in bloom, you wait till about two thirds of the blossoms have dropped and then you start in with a fruit tree spray uh, and you do that every two weeks on apples until the end of July. Mm, ours? <laughs> Got it zero. Well, I take that back. I did it one time. One time when I started noticing did some damage and... It's like a budworm thing. Kinda, yeah. You it's just like have, you to, have keep, to keep on it. Keep up on it. And I, you know, and so I've kind of considered with the amount of orchards in our area and the amount of apples that we could easily get our hands on for right. a good price, is it worth having to spray? Yeah. Because we've taken pretty great strides at not spraying mm -hmm. out there. And it's a contact spray. I mean, if there are bees present, it mm -hmm. would kill them. Um, so kind of have to like should we get rid of those apple trees are they gonna be wormy every year yeah i don't know i'm still kind of considering it they're small enough now to where we could replace them with things like the nectarine and peaches that we don't have to spray in season right might be nicer i don't know i do like the thought of picking apples off a tree though there's something like very country about that yeah. or i don't know nostalgic memories uh brendan braun said can you keep the fruit to ripen off the tree and will you need to treat the birch with anything to keep it healthy I suppose. I think it kind of depends on the stage of your fruit. If you can get it to ripen off of the tree. And I don't know if mine were close enough. I mean, they are, they're still hard, hmm. like hard, hard fruit, which made me feel like even though I was doing the thinning super late, I thought, well, they probably will size up a bit because they're so hard. And they still have so much left to go to get to that ripe stage that we might get some decent sized fruit. Uh, well, you need to treat the birch with anything to keep it healthy. Yes. You have to do a systemic on birch trees, willow trees, um, specifically in our area to keep the borers out. So what we usually do in systemic, um, if used improperly, can be one of those tricky things. Uh, so we wait till our trees are done with their bloom cycle before we treat with the systemic, and then that's when we treat, and it keeps them all healthy. No Zero said, look at all the fruits. Laura, do you fertilize your fruit trees? I haven't. I mean, I did Biotone starter fertilizer, and I think I might have done a tree tone or mm -hmm. uh, maybe, did I do tree tone? You know, I remember early this spring, <clears throat> Paul went through and did tree tone on all of our... So he probably did the orchard trees, I'll ask him. Well, I don't know. I don't... Because I went through and I remember telling him like, okay, hey, we want to do all these trees. I don't remember telling him to, to do, do the orchard. Trees. Because he actually took a camera and yeah. we made that little video. Well, so far they don't seem to need it. And we don't usually... I mean, we'll fertilize young trees, but we don't usually fertilize trees once they've established. Right. Or if they're, you know, unless they have an issue. Yeah, I feel like maybe like you can fertilize the first three to five years. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's like, you know, they're on their own. Yeah. But it's nice in the first five years for them to get some extra nutrients mm -hmm. to like establish a good root system. Yeah. Katie said, Bethany's pigs will be so happy. Uh, you can think of it as recycling, which is kind of how I look at it. Um, what is your favorite way to use the peaches when they ripen? I like to eat them fresh. I made some peach streusel muffins last night and they weren't from our peaches. They were from our neighbors. Mm. It's so, so sweet. Our neighbors bring us produce, Yeah, <laughs> which I love. Well, it's like what we do when you have an abundance, yeah. you start looking for people like, yeah, who, like who, who can, can I give I this to? This with? Yeah. So they brought us two loads of peaches already. Um, in fact, the peaches that we froze and put over the yogurt, uh, when I was down at the garden center, you grate them over vanilla yogurt and then put cinnamon and honey on top. Oh, those peaches came from their orchard just down the way. And they're the people we bought the South garden land from yeah. where our orchard is now. It's nice. I don't know how their peaches are so far ahead of ours. So far. Maybe just more established trees. Possibly. Yeah, they have quite the orchard. I think at one point he said there was a hundred and some trees out there. Yeah. yeah. A couple acres of orchard. Yeah. And I know that Noreen cans a ton. And usually when they bring us a Christmas plate or two full of just wonderful cookies and caramels and things, and there's always an apple butter and there's always one other type of jam or something from mm -hmm. fruit from their orchard. But I eat a lot of the peaches fresh. And I know you're not like a huge peach fan. Mm-hmm. Do you Correct. like them in like desserts or? Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. You're well, more well. of a pear apple man. Yeah. And also for, yeah. 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 Heather said, what are you supposed to spray on the apple trees every two weeks? You can use Captain Jack's fruit tree spray. I think it's a neem is what it is, but you have to be very careful about when you're spraying it. Again, um, you want to spray it at like dusk when the honeybees, like when it's almost dark, when all of the 
pollinators are gone for the evening, uh, just be really careful with any kind of spray, because organic or not, which this one is, but organic or not, they're still pesticides, so you just wanna be careful with it. Janet said, could you please tell us what weather app you use? I love that you get so much great detail from whatever source you're using. I just used the one on my iPhone. Yeah. What is that? Is it just like the... Yeah, is it weather.com or something? I don't know, but it's always pretty dang close. Does it say? Right now it's 61 outside. Today's high is 80. Our forecast looks amazing. Not getting into the 90s for the next 10 days. Hopefully not for the rest of the summer. Yeah, I don't I don't see it just says weather. Buy an iPhone. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, sunny conditions will continue all day. Wind gusts are up to 14 miles an hour. No big deal. Yeah, it's a good day. You know, Apple's coming out with the new iPhone. Oh, I like need September one. 12th. You guys should see mine. It is crack. It's cracked now in three spots. And the cracks, like they start here and they run down like a spider web down. And then I've got a crack here that runs one's up here and then one down here. In fact, my whole case, look at this right here. I think this is where I stick it in my pocket. Was it like uh... be aghast at this, Erin? I can't even like grip it. Let's see, that's why it's breaking. Is it just right worn there. down? It's just like worn out, hmm. starting to fall apart. I'm always interested whenever the new iPhone comes out because of uh, like whatever update they've made to the camera. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I was like, ooh, can we use this for? I don't know videos? what this one is, but I don't like the camera on this one. I don't know what this it is. It seems like you liked the camera on like the 10. 7. 10. Yeah, I think it was the X that yeah. when they. That was it the wasn't best. wasn't called the 10. It was like it the iPhone X or whatever. It didn't mess with the lighting. The, this one messes with the lighting. It makes it like kind of grainy and blue. It's weird. And I know in post I can change, not the graininess. It, uh -huh. it makes like a weird, I don't even, like a cartoon quality. Well, it, me it looks like an iPhone. I mean, I can usually spot iPhone footage, mm -hmm. but it's still pretty good. I feel like for, for what it is and how small of a, camera well, you have sure. in your pocket and how yeah. convenient it is yeah you always have it with you you always have so. it with you i feel like it does a pretty good job it does for video definitely yeah definitely for video it's the pictures that i have a hard time with yeah i would agree with you i think that um if you're getting into video like if you're wanting to make youtube videos mm -hmm. and you're starting with something the iphone to me just like blows away the competition for video, mm -hmm. not for photos. Right. I think that other companies have good phones mm -hmm. that make that do photos. I think iPhone's fine for photos. But. You know, it's because I use a GoPro for most of my filming, most of it. If it looks, if we do a planting video that looks extra good, it's because Aaron, I've like asked you to come out and film it, or you say like, I think I'm gonna come out and film that today. It'll look yeah. better, and we use the nice cameras. But it's so, they're so clunky and it adds such a different element. Mm -hmm. um, and really, like, it does make it look like more cinematic and mm -hmm. that sort of thing, but it really is not necessary for everyday stuff. GoPros are just lightweight, they can handle the light, dark, light, dark kind of issues. You don't have to man the camera to fix lighting, uh, which is really nice. And uh, they're kind of impervious to my treatment. You can drop them. <laughs> yeah. Or the wind, like, the wind will gust and yeah. that sort of thing. And, Anyway, but when I'm doing a video that requires me to go in and out, like at Andrews, when I'm down at the garden center, and if I'm outside, I'm using the GoPro. The second I need to step inside, I get my phone out and put my GoPro big old clunky thing in my pocket, and I use my iPhone because the lighting inside is much better. And also, if I need to get close on anything, whether I'm outside or inside, I get my cell phone out and do the close-up footage with that. Because yeah. GoPros just don't do it. Yeah, there's a lot, GoPros are limited in a lot of ways. Yeah. But they're handy in a lot of ways too. It's an action camera. I mean, that's it's built as an action camera. Mm -hmm. So the way we're using it is not really, I think, what it was intended for. Sure, sure but, is nice though. They're yeah. so lightweight. And the question was about my weather app. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, Caitlin said, "You've such you've had such interesting weather this year. Have you considered getting a home weather station?" It's great to know actual rainfall for your property, wind speed, high and low temps. I think it would be an interesting addition to the that property. That is actually a really good idea. It is. Yeah, if I've never thought about that. Something that uh, they recorded all the data. Yeah. That'd be awesome because like this year, you know, everybody's talking about how like everything's so hot and blah blah, blah and we're like not, not here. here. <laughs> we're, like we've been getting more rain than usual. Yeah. It's cooler than usual. It's not as brown. Is it's it? not as like our everything is more green outside mm -hmm. and I've turned off the sprinklers more times this year than I have probably ever I living in this house. Plants look better, one, because they're getting more rain, but the rain water is better than our irrigation oh, yeah. water by far. So 
uh, you know, yeah, being able to actually see the data mm-hmm. of like how much rain. Because I've always wondered that. Like, yeah, you should look into that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a that great be, idea. That would be fun. I'll, yeah, I'll look and buy one. Okay. Colleen said, I used your dormant and fungus spray and followed your directions to the letter while it killed my apricot tree. It had blossoms, new leaves, and whammo, it's dead. All the leaves turned brown. Branches have no green ones scraped. What the heck? Well, Colleen, I'm sorry you lost your tree. That is a huge bummer, but I don't think it was because of the sprays. If you were using the exact sprays... The exact ones, like I would, I would need picture proof that you're using the exact sprays that I use at the exact mix ratio in a clean sprayer. There's no way in season or out of season spraying that tree, you could have killed them, killed it. Um, there are a lot of different types of fungus sprays and dormant sprays that you're not supposed to spray when there are leaves present or at certain times of the day, certain temperatures. So if you were using a certain version of a dormant spray that wasn't exactly mine, it could have been... What version was yours? Mine was the All Seasons Horticulturals from mm-hmm. Bonide. All Seasons Horticultural like uh, oil spray could be used in or off season as a dormant spray. It does. You actually mix it differently as a dormant spray oh. versus an in season spray. That could have been your issue because it says that you had blossoms and new leaves. Um, when you're mixing it for a dormant tree, which I did mention in the video, it is a different mix ratio than in season. Mm-hmm. So possibly that could have been it. Um, yeah. Or something else could have gone wrong. Or your sprayer, if you're using a, the same sprayer for different things, if you're using it for, like we have sprayers dedicated for different things. If it's an insecticide or a fungicide or a dormant oil, you can usually use all of those interchangeably in one sprayer. Just give them a good clean between. Uh, if you're using something for an herbicide, that needs to stay in an herbicide container. Unless there's like a sterilizing thing you can put, solution you can put in. I wouldn't even trust it, no. though. No. It's cheap enough to get another sprayer. Just, yeah. Like you have, have two have, different sprayers or three different sprayers. If you put Roundup in a sprayer, like just... That's your that's your yeah. herbicide sprayer. So we usually have herbicide, insecticide, and fungicide sprayers. Hmm. And we have them um, like big letters. You know, I uh, write them in markers, so... Anyway, I don't know any other wisdom on that. Well, like you said, yeah, it it couldn't have been the mix no. that you used. But well, unless I mean she's using it at a different time. I yeah. mean, if you if you're using it at the same time, like uh, I don't know, it's hard to include all of the like caveats and mm-hmm. details. But I would assume somebody watching the fruit tree spraying video when they're dormant would follow the instructions when their trees were also dormant, not mm-hmm. in leaf or bloom. Um, because that changes things. Sure. So, I mean, this is good learning for me because I know what to say now just to like remind people Mm -hmm. to read the labels and remind them that things are different if you use a slightly different spray or a slightly different time. Right. Okay. Next video is helping with fall setup at the garden center. So I went down and they had already kind of moved stuff around a little bit in the store, but Monica had all the fall stuff, um, like product laid out in our back storeroom. And we were able to go through and just redo the windows and like put the wheat wreaths up that we had made from the wheat we grew out in our garden and put some fall product out. It actually spanned two days because we ended up having to, we got to a point where we needed so many supplies to finish that we thought and I had things I got to get had to get done at home and all of that so it was uh, like one afternoon and then the next afternoon it was really fun uh Tart Christine said I love watching all three of you decorating for fall when is it a good time to plant fall plants for zone 8b our temperatures have been between 100 and 105 I'm scared to plant anything in this heat right now it's not the best to be planting in the heat usually you want to wait until it cools off a little bit we still do just as long as you keep it wet keep it moist they're usually fine Uh, But it is a little riskier right now, like in the 80s, like 70s and 80s. Oh, that's a perfect time. So you might wait a little bit longer and give it it some time, let it cool off a little more. Uh, Pecan said, who won the casualty gift card? I never saw any announcement and I watch every day. Where can I find the winner's name? We don't make an announcement in a video. We just, we contact the winner Mm -hmm. and then we put the winner's name in the description of the video where we talked about the contest. So where we unboxed those benches for the cut flower garden, I talked about that the contest and how you enter and all that. And so then we put the winner's name down in that description of that video. And I think, I think that you mentioned that in the video, right? And where, where we could find, but I did not say that I wasn't going to announce it in another video. So maybe next time, see, this is good. Yeah. Like I know what to say, like gather all this information to make it easier. Right. Going forward. Uh, Leanne said, this is beautiful. How's the old gazebo doing? chilling yeah down at the park looking good down there looks way better in that park than it ever did in our garden 
Yeah. Like it looks more scaled or more appropriate there. Yeah, I feel like they could use some more like shrubbery around yeah, it. Yeah, but I think that's the plan. It's a little perched. Yeah. They used bigger posts mm -hmm. to put up the roof because that's basically what they took. Mm -hmm. Well, they took the roof and then they took all the side pieces down mm -hmm. below. Which they're using. Yeah. And uh, they just replaced all the posts basically. And they used, ours were like four by fours. And so it looked like toothpicks holding up this giant hood. Um, and they used some like beefier stuff mm -hmm. and it looks really nice. Franny said, can you order from the garden store? Uh, you can, they do have a website, andrewseed.com. Uh, they don't necessarily keep it updated with stuff. I think like they've got some of their seeds, their bulk seeds and things like that. And some, some product, um, oftentimes like at Christmas time, when we do a, a Christmas tour, they'll put some ornaments up there. Um, and you can call at any point. If you see anything in our videos that you like, you can call down to the store uh, and talk to them and they're really happy to put together an order for you. They do it a lot. Uh, Lisa Carlson said, I know you do a lot of seed starting from the spring and summer, but do you do any fall seeds? I've learned so much about seed starting from you. It would be fun to see what you do uh, seeds for fall planting. Uh, I think that video might be out before this one is. Mm. I did start some fall crops from seed out in our raised beds. So that's going on. And then I think I'm going to get going on some uh, high tunnel varieties of vegetables that like perform extra good in high tunnel or greenhouse situations. So we can possibly get some production going in there. I tried last year, but I didn't start quite early enough. And I didn't uh, think about the fact that there's probably varieties out there that are more suited mm. for greenhouse growing. So I just like grew whatever I had, you know, and they, they did okay, but not great. Uh, Paige said, does anyone know if a certain variety of Rudbeckia has the medicinal benefits or if it's any variety? Same with Echinacea. What's the medicinal benefit of a Rudbeckia? I've never heard of that. So we know that Native American tribes used black-eyed Susan wildflowers to treat snake bites, earaches, and get rid of parasitic worms. Huh. And since I just found out today that there's a medicinal use, I have no idea what variety. Yeah. It's probably like Rudbeckia herta, H-I-R-T-A, I'm guessing. Let me click into this and see. So yeah, black-eyed Susan's Rudbeckia herta, H-I-R-T-A. Hm. Interesting. Uh, same with Echinacea. Echinacea purpurea is the one that you want. And that's the, well, I started that variety along with a few others, but that's the one that really took off for us this year. And they're blooming in the cut flower garden right now. They're gorgeous. Rosa Vargas said, you girls are wonderful. Will you guys take over the business after your parents retire? Just a thought. I doubt it. You don't think so? Do you think so? I have no idea. I don't think they have any plans to retire at the moment. I don't I know don't what their plan is. I don't think that Monica has any plans I don't think that's something that she would like to do. Uh, no, probably not. And I don't think that it's something that you have the time to do. But you could shift things around. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we'll see what the future brings. Running a garden center is a lot of work. Yes. It's a lot of like manual. Yeah. And I don't think that there's, I also don't think there's like a huge, like people don't start garden centers to get rich. They do it because they love plants. <laughs> don't you think? I suppose. Yeah. Thankfully the, I mean, the garden center is just part of the business. Mm -hmm. Um, they'd run a huge seed cleaning operation as well. And so it's kind of different diversified, which mm -hmm. is really nice. Yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Next video is planting five gorgeous evergreens that stay small. So I think they were almost all, or they were all from Isley, mm -hmm. the Isley load that we got in. And most of them stayed on the small side of things. There was one that got like 12 by six. That's still small for an evergreen. For an evergreen, anything that stays narrow like that, six feet is a narrow evergreen. I mean, I would still c categorize that as a medium mm -hmm. probably, but the other one stayed on the small side and I loved it. I could load that gator up every day with just evergreens and get them out in the garden. It just, I just know when I put them in, like you're going to look like this all year long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Dee Berg said, are these evergreens okay to plant near water main lines? Are the roots invasive uh, in a regular home lot setting? I would say you would be okay with something like that. Evergreens, first of all, aren't going to be searching for water and when they stay on the small side, they're just, the root system stay a lot smaller as well. Peggy said, when you have plants that don't need as much water as others in the same drip area and it's all on drip, how do you control it so you don't waterlog the things that don't need as much water? You know, we just kind of try to find a happy medium. We water every other day and you just, you know, some things would like water a little bit more often, mm -hmm. um, but we soak it a little bit harder every other day versus mm -hmm. watering every day. 
And that means when you plant some new things, you might need to go out and give it a little bit of supplemental water for a couple weeks. Yeah. You're going out there on the off days yeah. to give those things a little extra. Cause yeah, you don't want to just keep wet feet right. on everything. Well, and we use two different methods of drips. Uh, you know, in areas where I've got perennials where I want them to naturalize or spread out, we'll do the brown drip tubing with the holes every 18 inches. And then for a lot of the evergreens we plant, they just get individual emitters run to the root ball. So you can really control the amount of water too mm -hmm. that they're getting. Um, so oftentimes we'll start off with larger emitters because as a new plant, especially if it's hot, you want to make sure that that root system stays at least a, somewhat damp. Uh, and then the next year we can clip those emitters off and put smaller emitters on. So I've never done that before because I oh, feel Paul like does. the root, um, the root system gets larger and needs more water as mm. the plant gets larger. Uh -huh. So I mean, I've, if you've told Paul to do that, I've never personally done that We've myself. swapped some out, like on butterfly bushes and things like that. Not just evergreens, but those things that just don't want a whole lot of water sure. will adjust sure. there. Not, we don't do it all the time, yeah. but yeah. A uh, loco Finch Avery said, anybody else see what happened at Proven Winners Direct? Really unfortunate. It is unfortunate. Was that rain or was it like a... Yeah, I think it what was happened? just some type of a storm that went through. I, I, you know, I didn't hear exactly, but I got the sense that it was just a, just a regular storm that just brought a lot of rain. I mean, they were, uh, how many? So for those who don't know, Proven Winners Direct is a four-star greenhouse, which is like one of the owners of Proven Winners. And Near Detroit, got, right? Yeah. Near. Uh, Car Carlson or Carlton, uh -huh. Michigan, which is, yeah, just right out of, it's like a suburb of uh, Detroit. So they just flooded uh, they got a lot of rain and they had this, like, I think it was their first like garden tour event. They had the tent all set up with the chairs and the tables, tables yeah. and then they just had to cancel it because it was just underwater. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, like they, literally, they I didn't mean... have canoes, so there was no way to do the tour. So really unfortunate. I think, you know, the water will go away and plants will just probably some, be okay. Plants will probably be okay. They'll just have they, to, they won't up. look great probably. Yeah. This year, anyway. Those kinds of things are just the worst. They really I, are. I think that uh, their display garden is open to the public, though. Mm -hmm. And so anybody can go look at it when mm -hmm. it's not underwater. Right. So if you ever have a chance, if you're, like, going through, like, near Detroit, you should definitely check Worth it out. It. It's a Proven Winners signature garden, they call it. Mm -hmm. And we toured it one time, and it was... Really impressive. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Really impressive. Uh, Donna Bryden said, has your well water pressure in your house declined with the addition of these plants over the years? No. No. It's been awesome. Yeah. Scott Roo said, beautiful Russian sage. What variety is it? I need some for my rose garden. That variety is either denim and, uh, denim and lace or sage advice. It might be sage advice. Mm. I can't remember. I had, I had like a, a bunch of them. Mm. <laughs> for, I can't remember. Like if I had a project in mind, they worked out great right there. Um, but I had both of those varieties last year. And that's when I put them in. So eh, they're super similar. Uh, Joanne said, I want to put two evergreen shrubs in a pot. What kind should I get? I want to put lights on them at Christmas time and then put them in my flower bed next spring. We've had really good luck with boxwoods and containers over winter. Honestly, like a boxwood cone mm -hmm. does really well. Um, yeah, I haven't tried a tremendous amount of different types of evergreens. A lot of people have like the Alberta spruces, which I don't care for quite as much. Um, We've had the most luck when you don't plant. Well, we're talking about wintering it over. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Aaron doesn't like evergreens as a centerpiece if you're planting annuals. Well, no, it's not that I don't like it. It's just that in my like observable experience, they always die. You don't like centerpieces as a whole, though. That's true. Mm -hmm. Well... I've, there aren't very many centerpieces that, uh, last for very long or stay tidy. Like, yeah, nothing stays tidy mm -hmm. that I know of and nothing lives like our purple fountain grass. <sighs> yeah. It rains. And then, yeah, I'm actually going to do fall planters this year. I think we're going to tear out all, uh, not next week, but the week after I think I'm going to tell tear you all every year, just don't do centerpieces. And every year you put something in there and it, to me, I not think, every year. Not every year. Most years you put centerpieces in. Have I done it every year? Maybe I've done it every year. And it just, it lowers the amount of time you get out of a container. It does, especially. Significantly, like by like a month or two. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that this, uh, is it skyrocket? planted my flag on the, yeah. on the hill. I'll I, die here. <laughs> I think the skyrocket penicetum, I think that's what it's called with the white in it. 
I think that one stays more tidy. That one takes yeah, forever it's smaller. to take off. It takes forever and it's yeah. smaller. Although I think in the um, you did bubble gum one year in the East Side pots, and I think you did Skyrocket, and it just never. Took I off. did that pink salvia. Oh, is that what it was? Unplugged pink. That just but those containers lasted until like yeah, because you couldn't see October. the centerpiece. Yeah. yeah, I think the biggest thing when you're choosing an evergreen and you're wanting it to stay in pots all winter is just to choose one that's hardy enough for your zone. And they usually recommend that you do something rated two zones lower than your growing growing zone. So for us though, boxwoods are usually a zone five, and we're in a zone six. But I've had good luck with them. Also, um, making sure you keep them watered. I mean, even if you're getting snow, you think, oh, they're fine out there. Still got to water them. Like two weeks? Every two weeks? Every two to three weeks. We water everything. And Christina said, how did the pond do with all the rain? It did great. Filled up? Yeah, it filled up. Uh, it filled up so much that like it was up over the sides and mulch was getting into the pond. Uh, but the mulch all went over to that filter area and just like stayed. Yeah. And we were able to net it right out. It was perfect. Yeah, it did great. Michelle said, have you given any more thought to planting something on the arbor you put over the stone path in the south garden? I love the arbor right there and imagine it would be beautiful covered with some color. Yes, we probably won't get after it until next year. I do have some thoughts on what I want to do there, uh, but I'm just not positive. And at this point of the year, I don't think I could even get what I wanted. So, but not roses though. Roses are awesome as climbers, but they're so fleeting. Like you get an amazing show, uh, first part of summer, usually late spring, early summer, and then they lull or they just throw out a few blooms and you might get another show, but I don't, I don't know of a rose that looks awesome all the time. Mm -hmm. And then you do have like the petal drop. Except for and the that dead one. Um, what's the one in the South Garden? Oh, all dressed up. All it's dressed not, up. It's not a climber. It's a shrub rose. But that rose. Looks good all year. All year. It's always got color. The leaves are deep green, glossy. Mm -hmm. The plant looks robust. Like all dressed up is a good variety. I also started with nice plants from my parents' garden center, though, too. There's, you know, there can be a difference, mm -hmm. like the grade of rose that you're getting. And they started off with big stocky stems and yeah. Next video was planting some amazing plants for winter interest. I think you, you were out there helping me with yeah. that one. Yeah. We did the Spartan junipers, which we need to move one. Oh, still? Yeah. I think it looks, it's not, I thought maybe it's it got off moved. by like this much. I huh. stepped it off yesterday. Did you? I stepped it off to the root ball of each plant, and one of them is about that much further back. You know what? And that to me, I'm like, I can't do it. I can't. Ah. Agree to disagree. <laughs> so we did the Spartan junipers. We did the blue Korean cedar. We did um, some northern sea oats by the pond. So a grass is a great winter interest. Invasive. Um, it hasn't been here for me. And honestly, if it seeds itself over there, I kind of want that natural look in that area. Sometimes you want that. Um, yeah, but I guess the in some areas, maybe where it's more wet, mm -hmm. those little seedlings will sprout up. It depends on if you don't cut it back too. If you like the grass and want to just cut it back in the fall instead of letting those seeds possibly fall on the ground, you could get after a lot of that spreading issue probably that way. What else did I plant? I had um, the junipers, I had the cedar, I had the grasses, and I feel like there was something else. Oh, the dogwood. We mm -hmm. planted the um, yellow twig, the detarian dogwood. Is that it? So maybe that was a lot of things. Amy said, are there any plans to plant soon on the west side by the little fountain in front of the house? I love all that you do, but I'd love to see a different area planted up beside the south garden. We do have some thoughts and plans on that. In fact, we actually went out to start a video where we were going to paint some lines and show you our rough sketch for that area up there. Uh, but then we kind of backed off on that because there's so many other things going on, like the area around the pond with the flagstones that hopefully will be done like pretty soon, I'm mm -hmm. guessing. They're working hard on it. And then we've got the area in front of the Hartley where we need to get the grass up and get the pathway done in that space. Those are two more important areas to me than the front. Like the front's fine right now. It's not hurting anything up there. Um, so anyway, I always end up planting out in the South Garden because I'm waiting on the infrastructure or hardscape stuff to get done. Mm -hmm. And then once that's done, then I feel like I can go for it in those spots and get those done. I just, I do have a little bit of a, what is that? Like a block? No, like a, a threshold. Threshold. I have a only this, only so many things can be torn up at one time threshold. Yeah. Well, you also have the ability to stop seeing things. I do. I can block. I can. I can block a lot out. Some people can have like a conversation right next to me. They could be talking to me. Mm -hmm. But I mean, <laughs> I mean, when it comes to like, things like um, an area like that that's unfinished, mm -hmm. you can leave that unfinished as long as it's tidy. Tidy. 
tidy Louise. but unfinished. Yeah. You can leave it unfinished for like five years mm-hmm. and you just stop seeing it being unfinished. Mm-hmm. You look past it and you're looking at the roses behind or you're looking well, at... There's so many other beautiful things yeah. and fun things to be working on that... And then I don't want to have, like I said, I don't want to have like five areas torn up. I'd rather have two areas torn up yeah. or ideally one area torn up at one time. So yeah, it's not torn up. It's just unfinished. Well, and you know, you have to wait on other people's schedule too. You know, they've got other things going on and other projects they're working on. And so some are worse than others. Pedro mm-hmm. and his guys are really good about like getting on things, getting it done fast. And so it's less of a wait, but mm-hmm. there's still a, a wait time, you know? And so like, I can't plant around the pathway until the pathway's done, you yeah. know, kind of a thing. Anyway, we do have some thoughts though, that I think are going to be, they're going to be great for that space. Helen Jackson said, what about planting some broadleaf evergreens? Any good ones for your area? Um, broadleaf evergreens, like there's euonymus and boxwoods that we do plant. Uh, photinias are beautiful, but they're marginal here. I'm trying to think of any other broadleafs that we could actually plant. Aphrodite. That's not a, a, an evergreen though. No. Oh. I wish it was. That would be awesome. The calicanthus, that sweet, sweet shrub, I mm-hmm. think. I just, I looked at that plant when we were in Michigan. We were at uh, Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. We stayed in the cottage in their big, beautiful garden. And I just, I saw that and I fell in love with that shrub and just thought, I will never have one that does not look like something that would survive our area. And, you know, sometimes you just try it and some things take and that shrub is awesome. We need more of those. Marcella said, or Marcella said, does anyone else notice that Laura did not say, and we'll see you in the next one. I wonder what happened. I don't know what happened. Yeah, I, got, I asked you about that. Yeah, I was like, where's the extra footage for this? I got all distracted by those fish. I wanted to feed the fish, and I thought you guys might like to see that. And then I just, yeah, but it was too dark. I remember you saying, like, so what do you want to do? I'm like, well, <laughs> just end it because there's nothing I can do. Like, there's no going out there and being like, P.S., see you guys in the next one. <laughs> and, you know, um, yeah, so that happens sometimes. Maine Blaine said, do you know what species or variety the giant decades old juniper is that's going to your next year house? I have no idea. It's an amazing big old tree though. And there are several in our town like that are that big. It's just amazing. Yeah. I I wonder if like somebody brought in a load of those trees Mm -hmm. and you know, certain people in town bought them or, Mm -hmm. you know, like, was there a garden center? Probably in Fruitland. It was probably, um, Fruitland Nursery. Fruitland Nursery. Uh Uh-huh that you know brought in a load of these things and people in town planted them 80 years ago uh, i don't know if fruitland nursery was there 80 years ago i don't know maybe I don't they're know. old trees though they are old trees they're really old yeah flower girl said the fish have gotten so big did you add more or are these the original guys those are the original guys and i do think they've gotten a little yeah. bigger and they're getting a little less skittish um they did say it would take a while we go out there and feed them every day and i tell the kids like we need to be gentle and quiet and not like uh, up next to the water and um, I stuck my feet in there the other day, and one of them came like this close. It was like kind of down in the water, just like kind of looking at me. <laughs> so fun. Corinne said, are, the, are there sections of your garden that smell amazing from all the plants in some areas that are overpowered by the smells? Okay, let me tell you about two of them. There's one really good one, and that's the sweet pea area. Oh, yeah? Oh, you just drive by that. It smells so good. Also, our neighbor's linden trees mm-hmm. in the spring when they bloom... It's like dryer sheets. It's like dryer sheets, but I love it because I, I like strong. If you smells. like dryer sheets, you'll like. Yeah. And so I just drive through and I'm just so thankful for those trees. Truffula pink gonfrina is one of the worst smelling plants ever. And it does not affect, or it, some people don't smell it, either mm-hmm. don't smell it, or in some areas it does not have the smell that it does here. Yeah. But it smells like body odor of somebody who's eaten like alliums of some kind. <laughs> like garlic or onions or something. It is it's the worst. And we drive by and I'm like, oh, <laughs> every time. And it's not even when you plant them in mass. I thought at first, like maybe it was because when we planted them up front, like maybe we can flash back a picture of that. It was intense. We had mm-hmm. so much up there and I thought, well, it's the concentration. I planted way too many, but I smell it even if there's one in a pot, I can smell it. I'm pretty, I, yeah. I have a good smeller though. It's- it's there. The smell is definitely yeah. there. You know, we never have an issue with boxwoods smelling. No, but we don't plant the English boxwoods. Yeah. So, yeah, we don't I, have I the always smell. notice that a lot of people comment on that. They're like, mm-hmm. oh, I can't stand the smell. And I, like, I know what the smell is like, mm-hmm. but I've never smelled it here. No. NW said, I've heard you say before too how the pink gonfrina smells awful. <laughs> have you tried any other colors? So I have. I'm growing uh, three or four or five different varieties in the cut flower garden right now that I started from seed and not 
a single one of them has a smell. Sharon said, do you ever worry about Benjamin and Samantha being around all those bees? I don't. I don't worry about them around the mosquitoes more than anything. Just that last rainstorm, and it's not around the pond. It's out in our south garden. Mm-hmm. The mosquitoes are just thick, and they're mm-hmm. big. They're big old beasts. I don't know. I don't know what. It's kind of like not dried out all the way since that rainstorm, it yeah. feels like. And the last video is the five project updates. We thought it would be a good time to get out and just update some projects without doing a full-on tour, which we will probably do here soon. Uh, but sometimes it's nice to kind of track the things that we've done the same season. Like the first, the first thing we talked about was the boxwoods, the sprinter boxwoods, which just, they looked horrible er- mm-hmm. earlier this season. And I was worried that we were going to have to take them out. I trimmed back, especially the ones in Versailles, hard. And I kind of wish I would have even taken them down more. And they looked worse after you trimmed them. They looked like horrid. They looked like they might just die on their own. <laughs> I know. And they're just like, they're beautiful now. So anyway, it was updates like that. We showed you the boxwoods. We showed you um, the area with the Super Tunia Mini Vista Yellow mm-hmm. and the Zinnias. And then also the white Zinnias begonias. in the cut flower garden. The white begonias. The boxwoods on the, the west side, we showed you the coleus and the two spots near our back kitchen entrance. And then Aaron popped on and talked about our autumn blaze maples. And you did a great job um, doing that. So it's just kind of fun to look back. Oh, when you put in that footage of when we planted the trees, the way the whole area looked yeah. out there, that's... Barren. Whoa. Yeah. I kind of forget. I forget. It's just crazy to me how much different it is now and how much more efficient it is and... It just, it's working really well. Uh, Sonia said, I'm wondering why you're not adding elemental sulfur or aluminum sulfate to lower, lower soil pH when you plant instead of just adding extra chelated iron. We do. I didn't talk about it, but uh, we do add elemental sulfur. Um, and it, the problem is, is that it's like the chelated iron is a quick shot and mm-hmm. you see the results like immediately. Whereas with the uh, elemental sulfur, you don't see it as immediately. So we still, we do it, but I, it's not something that I can be like, this will help. Like I know it will help right away. Um, so I don't, I don't know. We do use it. Do you think it'd be interesting to like for a full season when you were taking your plants around and planting them with the biotone, adding, like having two buckets, one with the biotone and one with, um, soil acidifier? Mm-hmm. Um, and then we just make it a habit of putting that in the hole at planting time. It'd be kind of interesting to see. Well, the thing is, I think that the soil acidifier gets leached out. It's like it's it's like gypsum. Like you can use it, but you got to keep using. But you it have over to start a habit of using yeah. it. Yeah. So if we did that, and I kind of want to get away from the bags of biotone um, and like just dump it into a bucket so mm-hmm. we can scoop it out. I think that would be a little easier. Maybe if we had like. Oh, sure. We had a planting gator. You know you know how we have an irrigation gator? We do. Right. We have like the pack out, the Milwaukee pack out. So mm-hmm. we used to store all of our uh, irrigation stuff. We have a gator. Paul's kind of set one up as an irrigation gator. Yeah. If we had a planting gator that had... Well, I think what you would probably prefer is the smaller bags of like plantone and all those things. I have a hard things. time opening some of those though. Well, you'd cut them with the scissors. I suppose. And then it'd just be open on a corner and yeah. you just pour it in. I think I that's... don't know. I, think, I don't think that's as efficient because I go through so much of it. Yeah. If I could just scoop, pour. Yeah. Nicole said, what did you use to kill the spider mites? We haven't sprayed for spider mites at all this year. Uh, in previous years, we were using Captain Jack's dead bug. And what were we using? Um, Malathion. We've tried all kinds of stuff. Cap- yeah, we've tried a bunch of different things. And you things. have to rotate. Right. Because and that's the mice. point is that you kind of, you go to the garden center and you're like, what's the next thing I can use that yeah. I haven't used before? Yeah. Um, fortunately, it's a little bit easier to spray boxwoods because they do have a short bloom time. And then, and we don't spray them during bloom time. Typically, that's early enough in the season. We don't even see spider mites yet. Um, and then we're spraying again at dusk. This year, I have noticed spider mites on a few things in the high tunnel, hydrangeas specifically, and a couple of the arbs that we still have in there. And then there's a couple hydrangeas on the west side that look mm-hmm. a little suspicious. Yeah. Um, Paul he, was going to spray them uh, two days ago. He, he told me okay. about it. Okay. And he may have. Um, we haven't been spraying, though, largely. Like, out in the main part of the garden, the predatory insects, the predatory mites we released, they feed on thrips and white, uh, white fly primarily and then they also feed on the two spotted spider mite which is what we have next year i'm thinking 
of doing the same type of predatory mite, but then also adding in another type of predatory mite mm -hmm. that well, goes only after the... But we need to do it more often. And whenever well, earlier. You, yeah, I earlier, get but after also earlier. when you see something later in the season, uh -huh. you go hit those things specifically with the... Like you order in one bottle of that uh -huh. stuff, and you go shake it on all the things where you see there's a population yeah. and let them eat on it. Yeah. Let them feast. Yeah. I think we just saw such a huge boom in, well, in thrips specifically because of the stuff we left up over winter, but the spider mites have been a lot more tame mm -hmm. this year than any other year. So I don't know. Maybe yeah. it's the cooler. They like hot, dry. Right. Um, and it hasn't been as windy this summer either. And I, that's all, you know, that's how they spread. A lot of the time they get blown around. And before we move on, we did do a video about spider mites. That might be helpful. I went through a whole bunch of different types of spray. So maybe we can link that down below. Jennifer said, could you overwinter the king tuck grasses in the greenhouse? I have a few, a few of these too and was wondering if I could overwinter them. I'd give it a shot. Definitely. They might kind of die back a little bit, but if you just um, cut them back and keep them somewhat damp and let them just chill there somewhere where they're warmer, they may flush back the next spring. User said, I love your California blend zinnias. How do you have them staked up? My zinnias are falling over or leaning outside the flower bed. We do not have those staked up at all. I mean, there's some of those super hoops in there, but they're only like every four feet. They're not really a staking system. I was thinking though about possibly using those and running some string kind of around because they will eventually start to topple. Our first crop that we have closer to the flower shed, they're looking kind of mangy and kind of tipped over and uh, that sort of thing. So the further they, the less fresh they are, they start to do that as well. Deanne said, is Aaron working on his plan for Christmas lights yet? I think we're gonna go more simple this year. Um, I think that we need to get a gate in before we like go out on Christmas lights again, because it's like, I don't mind when people come and drive through and look at the lights as long as I know who they are. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, when you put a lot of Christmas lights out, you're kind of like almost just asking people to come look. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a weird thing because it's like, you want people to enjoy the lights that you put out. Like we want to enjoy it, but we also want to share it, which is kind of why we do a video about it. Mm -hmm. And you want to share it with people. So like friends and family, totally awesome. If they want to drive through. Mm -hmm. I just want to know when they're coming. And Most people just text us. Yeah, and most people are like, like hey, hey, we're going to drive through tonight. Is that yeah. all right? You know? And I'm like, great. That's yeah. awesome. I, you know, I love it. I like mm -hmm. sharing that. But I also don't like it when just a bunch of random people drive through. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's weird. So yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, once we get a gate um, set up, which, you know, is it's in the works, but it... it might not be till next year. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think this year it's going to be a I'm more excited, simple display. Though. I'm excited. I think it's going to be, I don't know what word to classy. use. Classy? Maybe. No, that's classy. It is classy. Uh, Susan said, oh, uh, what what fun to have a pop of Aaron. It was fun to have you in there. You guys, <laughs> it's, it's often where you say, I'm going to go work on this or that. And I tell you, you should take a camera and film yourself. People would love it because it's stuff that like I don't, I don't deal with the trees like you do. Mm -hmm. And so there's things that I think people can learn from what you're doing yeah. outside in the garden. You know, I made a couple videos. Was it this spring or last spring? Mm, I can't remember. You know, I want somebody to film me. <laughs> I have to film myself. I know you do. Yeah, it's impressive. You what should you do, do is it. impressive. You should do it. Yeah, Because maybe. you have a different perspective than I do. And it's nice to have a change up. And we're working on it together. Yeah. Like this isn't just, I mean, I'm, pl I'm planting a lot of the smaller stuff myself, but, um, but I don't do, I don't take care of the grass. Right. I don't fertilize the grass ever. You do all of that. So I don't even know what your schedule is out there. Yeah. So it'd be nice. Everybody give Aaron a thumbs up. Oh, jeez. <laughs> if you want to see him more in videos. Will the maple trees eventually form a canopy over the driveway? That's our hope. They should, yeah. given the 40 feet spread. And we chose those trees because of their height, because we need to limb them up so far, mm -hmm. because we do get a lot of deliveries here, a lot of big trucks and stuff, and they have to be able to navigate through the tree canopy. So we chose something that would still look good, limbed up as high as we need to have them limbed. Uh, Nadia said, you guys get a dog, or was that a friendly neighbor just <laughs> visiting? Friendly neighbor just visiting. I've noticed her over here. Yeah, what's like, her name? I think it's Gracie. Oh, okay. And I think she's been here like the last week or yeah. so, a little bit more. She doesn't cause any issues. Oh no, she's not, a really yes, yeah, she's a good really dog. good dog. And in fact, Benjamin loves it when she's out there because yeah. she'll fetch and stuff for him. Mesa said, "Love the updates. Thank you. Do you think the release of the predatory mites had any effect on the spider mites infesting the sprinter boxwoods? It could have. It was also a, a much better year. Mm -hmm. 
all the way around weather wise. And Pamela said, how close together did you plant the yellow super tunias? Love this bed. I probably put them about, what is it? Two and a half feet maybe from each other, two feet ish. You know, I've got a photo that will kind of show it. I'll will put it? that on the screen now Okay. and maybe that'll help. They'll look closer together just because you have to consider root ball to root ball, not yeah. not Just look spread. at like the center of each because uh, yeah. I've got a photo where they're not touching. Sure. So. And that is it, you guys, for today's recap video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you have a great week, and we will see you in the next one. Bye.